Hello, my friends, and welcome tonight. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm sunburned. But there's a reason I'm sunburned, and I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. I would like to welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, hang on just a second. I got a couple things I got to finish setting up. There we go. I uh, welcome all of you here, and, and thank you for joining me. It's been a fun afternoon. This is my third fireside. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, one of them I went to and watched, and the other two, this one, uh, and another one I spoke at. And you know what? I've got to say, I have very few things that are more fun in my life and more fulfilling than teaching the gospel and spending time with you. I love being a missionary, even if it is for folks that, you know, are already converted. I'm just grateful to be here. Now, there, I posted earlier this week the link to the History of the Saints conference special about the origins and significance of the Doctrine and Covenants. Right after I posted it, we discovered that there was a problem with that link. So I posted a new link from YouTube, but I'm not sure that the word really got out. So Annie, if you wouldn't mind grabbing that link off of the History of the Saints page and posting it, that would be helpful right now. Now, one more thing. Before I begin tonight, please have a prayer in your heart. I cannot tell you the miracles and the good that have come because of you, your faith, and your prayers. Thank you so much, all of you, every single one of you, for being here, for praying for me and for each other. Wonderful things are happening because of you, and most of the time, you don't even know that it's going on. <clears throat> now to begin. What are the greatest desires of your heart. What is it that you want more than anything else? And my question, have you told the Lord? This story is in accordance with your Come, Follow Me curriculum for this next week. Orson was born at Hartford, Washington County, New York, about 1814. His family took up residence in Columbia County, New York, during the winter of 1829. 1830, Orson went to a boarding school where he studied geography, grammar, and surveying. Now, at the age of 18, Orson's soul experienced something of a religious awakening. Quoting, I began to, be, I began to pray very fervently, repenting of every sin. In the silent shades of night, while others were slumbering upon their pillows, I often retired to some secret place in the lonely fields or solitary wilderness and bowed to the Lord and prayed for hours with a broken heart and contrite spirit. This, he said, was for the Lord to manifest his will concerning me. This was my comfort and delight, the greatest desire of my heart, he said, was for the Lord to manifest his will concerning me. Then, in September 1830, two missionaries came into the area where he lived, one of them his older brother. As they preached, Orson recognized the truth, and on September 19, 1830, his 19th birthday, he was baptized the only individual to do so in that country for many years afterward. Orson immediately set out on a journey of 230 miles to the west, looking to meet the prophet Joseph Smith. And by November the 4th, 1830, he found Joseph at the Father Whitmer Farm in Fayette, New York. Now, after so many years of searching for the Lord and wanting to know his will concerning him, finally... Orson had found someone who could tell him. He asked Joseph, and Joseph told him that it was his privilege to know just that, the will of the Lord for him. Joseph invited Orson into the chamber of old Father Whitmer and by the aid of the seer stone began to dictate the word and will of Almighty God for Orson Pratt. 
When he invited the humble lad to write it down, Orson declined, considering himself not worthy. Would John Whitmer do it? Yes. And John Whitmer recorded that revelation that we know today as Doctrine and Covenants, section 34. In that revelation was given a promise to one of such humble origins as Orson seemed almost too great to attain to. He was called to lift up his gospel, to lift up his voice and preach as with the sound of a trump. Lift up your voice and prophesy, and it shall be given by the power of the Holy Ghost. That was the promise. In Orson's mind, how could he ever live up to that? Shortly after, he was ordained an elder and sent forth, and notwithstanding his weakness, Orson would become one of the most influential leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. He was always charging out ahead and a missionary. Now, that part of the story I have already shared in these firesides. This part I have not. In 1840, Orson Pratt, Elder Pratt, traveled with his brethren of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to the British Isles to serve there as missionaries. The Twelve arrived in the British Isles and scattered throughout the land. Orson went to Scotland, arriving in Scotland May 3, 1840. Shortly after, he organized a branch of the church in Paisley and from there went on to Edinburgh, which at the time, Edinburgh was considered one of the most educated, erudite, and civilized cities in all the world. Orson described the city of Edinburgh, Scotland, in a letter to his brother Parley, quote, It is one of the most renowned cities in the world. Its streets, gardens, and walks are extremely beautiful and pleasant, while the surrounding country, for the most part, presents an aspect delightfully variegated with gently rising hills and pleasant vales. As you emerge from the city on the the mountains or hills rise and suddenly the height of several hundred feet, which throws a romantic and sublime appearance over the whole scenery. From their summits, meaning the hills, there is a beautiful prospect, not only of the city, but for miles around. However, <laughs> as beautiful as the city of Edinburgh was to Orson, very few people would listen to him. He said, I found it almost impossible to awaken the attention of the people so as to get them out to hear. But I called upon the Lord with all my heart and persevered in preaching and testifying to the few who did attend, and after a few weeks, I began to see the fruits of my labors. He had baptized a mere, it's all relative, a mere 23 people in the early summer of 1840. Now, to Orson, that was not nearly enough of a harvest. Now, come with me to Edinburgh, and I'll take you here. Towering over Edinburgh is a beautiful, craggy summit called Arthur, Arthur's Seat. While he was there, Orson would often climb Arthur's Seat and look out over that from that beautiful hill out over the city. It was said that from there, Orson dedicated the land of Scotland for the preaching of the gospel. In one of Orson's prayers from the summit, he, and I don't know the language that's proper to use here, he struck a deal with the Lord. He would give his all to the work of the Lord, missionary work in Edinburgh, if the Lord would give him 200 converts before he left. Orson then received inspiration that he should go about the work differently than he'd been doing it. He took up a new method of proselyting. He'd been doing street contacting, just stand up on a soapbox and start preaching. He decided to try pamphleteering. He published a pamphlet after the pattern that his brother had, and it was entitled An Interesting Account of Several Remarkable Visions. The beautiful thing? That pamphlet, published by Orson Pratt, would be the first time Joseph Smith's first vision 
was ever written down and published. By the way, when Orson Pratt left the city nine months later, he had his 200 converts. And Orson's humble service continued. The subject of Section 34 of the Doctrine and Covenants was one of the first men to enter the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. It was he who, from 1876 to 1879, prepared new editions of the Scriptures, adding revelations such as Doctrine and Covenants 121 through 123. He divided the Book of Mormon into chapters and verses, and he did so much more. Then, October 3rd, 1881, after 51 years of giving his life to the cause of Christ, Orson Pratt passed away. What would it have been like to sit with the prophet Joseph Smith and watch him receive revelation on our behalf? I don't know. I can only imagine. What is it like to feel as though we are nothing and we have little to give and then have the Lord extend mighty promises, pick us up, square our shoulders, and send us out to work miracles. I know a little of that. We can all know what that's like and should. <clears throat> okay, now this, <clears throat> this story is why I'm sunburned. Yesterday, just yesterday, I shared a wonderful experience with my two daughters. One of them, the Annie that's on the other side of this camera who reads all your comments and posts all the links. Annie was with me. And the other daughter was my lovely Donnie Jo. We wanted to hike. Now, we've done this before. Back in January, we hiked Prairie Peak on Antelope Island, but this time we wanted to hike into a mountain lake. So... Donnie Joe looked on the map and found a lake up in the Wasatch Range called Desolation Lake. It's up Big Cottonwood Canyon just out of Salt Lake City. We gathered as much information as we could get and got ready. We arrived at the trailhead and there were people everywhere up there. Hardly a place to park my truck. Hadn't expected that. Another surprise came when we saw the trail. Now, we were told the trail only had snow up near the top, but from the first step onto the trail, it was snow all the way up and all the way back. Wet, slushy, sloppy, and slick. Okay, hadn't expected this, but we can handle it. We were prepared, and off we went up the mountain. Oh, and it was a beautiful climb. Quaking aspens, quakies everywhere, dug fir and subalpine firs, trees everywhere. Up the trail we went, hiking alongside, most of the time, a buried mountain stream. We could hear it, but only rarely could we, could we see it. We stopped along the way and identified trees, rocks, plants. We just took it all in. We stopped at one point and marveled at the blue sky against the backdrop of snow-covered mountains peppered with evergreen trees. The air was clear, the sun was bright, obviously, and the day was perfect. However, the higher we climbed, the less people we saw. The hike was only a little less than four miles, but slipping, sliding, and slogging through snow made that hike a lot more difficult than we had expected. Even though we were equipped, I say we were equipped, but the unexpected kept happening to our equipment. Annie's crampons kept slipping off up around her ankles. Don't do much good up there. And my camelback, my water backpack, well, it kept leaking all over me. And, obviously, we forgot the sunscreen. <laughs> but we kept going. Ah, Well, it took longer than we expected. 
There was one point where I was hiking up the trail, following the tracks left by others, when Donnie Joe hollered and said, Dad, I think you're going the wrong way. She was stopped back down the trail and she said, trail's over here. And she was right. I came back down, got on the proper trail. Shortly after that, we came up over a ridge and dropped down into a bowl surrounded on all sides by the mountains. It was the lake. We were there. But where was the lake? There was no lake, at least not what we were expecting. We'd been looking forward to crystal clear water with trees growing along the shore and gentle sound of waves lapping at the bank. There was none of that. Oh yeah, you could see where the lake was. You could see the outline, but it was completely frozen over and covered with several inches of virgin snow. No tracks, no nothing. It was magnificent though. Beautiful, clear blue skies, brilliant white virgin snow reflecting like a million diamonds, stately evergreens all around, peaks looming over our heads, and best of all, we were the only ones there. We took pictures. Joe made a snow angel, and we had all kinds of fun. The best part of all was being there with my daughters. I thought several times, why do they call this Desolation Lake? This is gorgeous. But at the end of the day, we were tired, sunburnt to the point of feeling like we'd been shrink-wrapped, and so sore we could barely walk. But we made it, and we made it together. And now the three of us all share a bonding memory that can never be taken away. And why do I tell you that story? Because... How much like the covenant path is that hike? We know where we want to wind up. We know where the trail is and generally which direction to go. But how often, my dear friends, on the covenant path do we get hit with the unexpected? How many times do we find ourselves spiritually slipping, slogging, sliding backward, barely making any progress, if at all? How often do we put our head down and take off and not pay any attention and find ourselves off the path and needing to get back on? How often do we stop and think to ourselves, oh, this is hard. This hurts a lot. This is a lot tougher than I thought it would be. All of that has been my experience on the covenant path. But if we keep going, tough our way through the pain, repenting and course correcting when necessary, the day will come by the grace of God and the help of the master when we will reach, we will cross over and reach our promised destination. I promise you, it will be different than we've envisioned. It's a promise. It'll be better. The Lord once said, quote, You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. End of quote. And it will not be a desolate destination for you. It will be glorious. But stay the course. Keep going. Don't give up. <clears throat> In April 2020 General Conference, President Henry B. Eyring quoted President Brigham Young. This is a very short quote, but all... Mama, is it packed full of steak and taters? He said, quote, I do not know any other way for the Latter-day Saints than for every breath to be virtually a prayer for God to guide and direct his people. End of quote. Elder Richard L. Evans, 
he once said, he who, lose, he who ceases to pray loses a great friendship, end of quote. I believe that statement is true. And like all friendships, even ours with our Heavenly Father takes time, effort on our part to develop. It doesn't come easily or naturally. Misunderstandings must be corrected and doubt and even laziness must be overcome. This story from the life of a friend of mine is so powerful, so instructive. She once shared this in a seminary devotional. She said that as a small child, she shared a room with her sister. As they would go to bed at night, Annie would either make sure she said her prayers first or she would wait until her sister Katie was finished. In her childlike innocence, she believed that if she and her sister were praying at the same time, Heavenly Father would get confused, wouldn't understand, or would just ignore her entirely. Annie wanted his full and undivided attention. <laughs> well, since then, my friend has come to understand she always has his undivided attention. In her words, she said, I still don't know how he can be aware of all of us, hear us all and know us all at the same time, but I know he can. End of quote. I hope that your relationship with your Father in Heaven through prayer grows stronger every day, a friendship always being worked on. <clears throat> now, in that regard, and continuing that thought, speaking personally, one of my greatest struggles is growing into the spirit of revelation, of learning, recognizing, and obeying the voice of the Spirit. I struggle with that every day. I have a lot to learn. I believe more than most of you. To some of you, revelation is intuitive. To some knotheads like me, it's not that easy. The year was 1884. Louis Munch, I told you about him a few days ago, Louis Munch had left his family behind in Utah and was now serving as a missionary in his native Germany. One evening as he was entering a small German town, he stepped off the road and knelt in prayer under a large tree and asked the Lord to be guided by the Spirit as to who would hearken to his message in that town. He felt strongly impressed that the first house he felt to stop at would be the one where he would be received and receive food and lodging for the night. The impression came so forcefully that Lewis had no doubt. So, got up off his knees and entered the town, and walked past a number of houses when suddenly he felt prompted to, quote, turn to the right and knock at the door of a house standing considerably in the rear and surrounded by a lawn, end of quote. Accordingly, Lewis knocked on the door and asked for a place to stay the night. To his surprise and consternation, the lady of the house said she had been cleaning all day and everything was in confusion. She sent him up the street to a friend. But Elder Munch was disappointed. He said, quote, I concluded that for once I had certainly mistaken the prompting of the Spirit. And he said, my faith was considerably shaken, end of quote. But he went on up to the next house and was again turned away and sent to the next one. And on and on it went from house to house until by 11 o'clock that night, Elder Munch stood at the last house on the edge of town and it was just turned away from there again. He said, quote, My heart commenced to fail within me as this last refusal was uttered for a night's lodging in the woods seemed inevitable, end of quote. Just then, a breathless young woman ran up to him. 
She asked if he was the man who had called at her mistress's house on the other end of town. He'd called at a lot of houses on the other end of town, but he said he was. Oh, she said, I have chased all through this town after you. For a peculiar feeling came upon my mistress after you left that she must accommodate you for the night. And so strong was this feeling that she sent me after you, telling me not to stop until I found you. End of quote. Gratefully, Elder Munch went back with the young woman, feeling to thank the Lord for a resting place that night. He then said, quote, But imagine my still greater surprise. When the young lady led me right back to the very house at which I had first knocked, and to which the Spirit had prompted me to go with the assurance that I should find food and lodging. End of quote. As he entered the house, the lady of the house was delighted to see him and welcomed him warmly. She invited him to sit down to a meal that she had prepared especially for him. As he was eating, she explained that after turning him away, she had no peace. And so greatly was she wrought upon with this feeling that she felt herself finally impelled to send her domestic to bring me back again. So confident was she of Elder Munch's return that the lady of the house had set to immediately in preparing a special supper and a clean bed for him. Elder Munch concluded, quote, None but a missionary knows how I felt that night when I bowed my knees in prayer before my Heavenly Father in thanksgiving for his kindness and mercy to me. End of quote. And by the way, you should know it was this same elder, Louis Frederick Munch, of native Germany, who frequently, while on his mission, wrote and translated gospel material for the German saints. While he was there, he also composed new words to a gospel song he had learned in America, which he took back to Germany, kept the tune, and wrote new lyrics in German. That hymn caught on, and became the most beloved and oft-sung hymn of the German-speaking peoples of Europe well into the 20th century. Later, the hymn that had started in America went to Germany, came back to America, was translated from German back into English, and given to the saints in the United States in the 1985 hymnal. The first line of that hymn, written by the elder who hearkened to the Spirit, is, Hark all ye nations, hear heaven's voice. Through every land that all may rejoice, angels of glory shout the refrain, truth is restored again. Love that story. Okay, hang on just a second. My mic is clear out here in the stratosphere. I need to bring it up a little bit closer and hope it doesn't wind up in the shot like that. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> I don't know if that was affecting the sound, but it certainly was annoying me. All right, my friends, I wanted to tell you, this book is now available. This is the Gathering Israel book, Missionaries and Converts. It is available, and we will begin sending it out tomorrow. I will sign a bunch of copies for those that are VIPs, and not that that matters, but I said I would, and we'll start shipping them tomorrow. So if you purchased a copy of the book, it's coming hopefully in a few days. If you don't have it, it's a collection of stories about missionaries, missionary work, Miracles, converts, conversion stories. It's awesome. I had so much fun building this book. I recommend it to you if you don't have one or would like to give one, even to your missionary that might be out serving. I think they would enjoy it. All right? It's available at glenrossonstories.com. Now, moving on. <clears throat> 
Are we doing okay? Annie, I assume we must be doing all right because you haven't yelled at me yet over anything, so I hope we're all right. Okay, this story is also from your Come, Follow Me curriculum. The love that God has for us is called charity. And if we don't have charity, well, we are nothing. But with charity, we are fit subjects for heaven. Why is this virtue of charity the greatest of them all? Maybe this story illustrates one reason why. July 20th, 1833, Independence, Missouri. A, a mob of some four to 500 men angrily decided in Jackson County that they did not like the Mormons, they called them, who had taken residence in their county and that they must leave. They drafted a resolution over the signature of the leading citizens of the county. Twelve men were appointed to present the demands to the Mormon leaders. They approached Edward Partridge, who was considered the head of the church there, William W. Phelps, and others with their unjust demands. Well, Bishop Partridge and the others asked for three months to consider the demands and to decide a course. That was denied them. They asked for 10 days. That too was denied. They had 15 minutes to decide what to do with 1,200 Latter-day Saints in the county and their possessions. Meanwhile, the mob returned to the courthouse and awaited their decision. When it did not come quickly enough to suit them, the mob divided up and attacked. They went first to the church-owned printing office, kicked open the door, tossed out the press, tore down the building, partially, burying in the process two of the Phelps children in the rubble. The mob then went for the church-owned Gilbert and Whitney store and began demolishing it and scattering the goods. Only when Gilbert promised to move out of the county in three days did the mob desist in their destructive actions. With loud yelling and cursing, the mob then went looking for church leaders. They burst into the home of Edward Partridge, and while his family watched, they dragged him to the public square of independence. If you notice the distance that they dragged him and their murderous rage and intent, it reminds you of a scene long before in a place called Nazareth. With the mob frothing around them, Edward Partridge and young Charles Allen were given an ultimatum that they must renounce the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith or leave the county. Bishop Partridge refused to do either, stating, quote, he was not conscious of having injured anyone in the county. Therefore, he said, I could not consent to leave it, end of quote. This infuriated the mob further, and they began to strip him of his clothes with the intent of tarring and feathering him. He asked for the dignity of keeping his shirt and pants on, and that was granted. They poured tar, mingled with pearl ash, a flesh-eating acid over his body, and then covered him with feathers. Bishop Partridge stood there without struggle or retaliation or recrimination as they brutalized him. Quote, I bore my abuse with so much resignation and meekness that it appeared to astound the multitude who permitted me to retire in silence, many looking very solemn, their sympathies having been touched, as I thought, and as to myself, I was so filled with the spirit and love of God that I had no hatred toward my persecutors or anyone else, end of quote. There it is. Charity is a heavenly gift from God through the Holy Ghost. And when a man is filled with the love of God, he bears no ill will to any man, not even and especially his enemies. That is why charity is the greatest of all. Thank goodness that only people like this dwell with God, live with God, and become as God 
Can you imagine the alternative otherwise? And as for the good bishop, he would go on to offer himself a ransom for his beleaguered people in Jackson County and eventually would so serve and so wear out his life as to die a premature martyr's death in Nauvoo. Next story. You see this? This old saddle back here? This old saddle is approaching 100 years old. I'm actually not certain how old it is because you see, I'm in my 60s and my dad was riding this saddle when I was born and it looked old then. I remember as a little boy learning to ride practically from the time I was old enough to walk. In fact, I was on a horse before I was old enough to walk. It was just my dad was helping me. But you know, when I was learning to ride, my dad would never, when I was just a little shaver, he wouldn't let me ride a saddle. He called it skinem. He would say, when you learn to ride skinem, then you can have a saddle. I guess one of my dad's biggest fears, and he just pounded it into me, was that I couldn't use the saddle until I could learn to use the saddle properly and not get hung up in a stirrup. My dad had a morbid fear of me getting hung up in a stirrup and getting injured or killed. Some of my most painful and exhilarating memories are those early years riding good saddle horses bareback. The first challenge for this little guy was to even get on a horse bareback. When I was really young and so short that I could barely see the horse's knees, I had to lead the horse to the fence and get on the horse that way. Later, as I got just a wee bit taller, I learned how to get a handful of mane and swing right up onto the horse's back. I got pretty good at that. Once I was on the horse, though, as a young'un, then came the trick of staying on. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It took balance, coordination, and sometimes a tight fistful of mane to stay on the horse. Even at that, I had more than one experience of the horse going this way at a full gallop and me going that. I can still remember to this day the feeling hang on, I can still remember the feeling of a good horse under my backside. I can't, call me crazy, but I can still remember that feeling. One of my choices to childhood memories was taking my horse out through the sagebrush on a dead run. The wind in my face, the horse leaping over ditches, jumping sage, clearing rocks, and me somehow sticking like glue to his back. Well, I don't remember the day when I finally passed my dad's exam because when it happened, he gave me this saddle. And from then on, it was mine. With this powerful tool, I soon, I soon learned that whatever I could do riding skinem, I could do better with this saddle. For example, can you imagine roping a critter from horseback when you're bareback, this saddle represents a legacy from my dad, a powerful tool that he gave me as a gift to make me a better man and a better cowboy. That's why it sits here. It's precious to me, just to me. In a very similar way, all of us have been given the gift of a sacred tool or instrument that empowers us to do better and be better. This gift is unspeakably precious. Indeed, it is sacred. Our physical bodies are not just an incidental, oh, by the way, part of the plan of salvation. Our bodies are the plan of salvation. Our physical bodies are a sacred, precious gift, a tool 
given to us by our heavenly parents, patterned after theirs, and capable of unimaginable power. And now it's ours forever. You should know that in the resurrection, all will be raised to perfect bodies, but not all will be raised to bodies of perfected equal power. There are bodies celestial, bodies terrestrial, and bodies celestial. Let us cherish the tool that God has given us to become like him. I hope you're doing okay. I noticed today when I was speaking at the other fireside um, how much difference it makes when I can see you. You're not just a green dot. When I can see you and look into your faces and I can see the emotions that cross your face, I'll always prefer talking to you face to face rather than talking to the camera. But we'll do the best we can for now. It never ceases to affect me how much heaven loves each one of us individually. This last week, especially as I listened to General Conference again, does God really love us that much and that personally? Like the brethren and sisters say he does? Yes. The Samaritans of Jesus' day were a people more despised than Gentiles. They were considered a mongrel, mixed race of people dating back more than seven centuries. Not only was their blood mixed, but their religious traditions were mixed and adulterated as well. The Jews were prejudiced against the Samaritans, had no dealings with them, and utterly despised them. Hence, it was a remarkable thing when the Lord's disciples came up over the hill and saw their master talking with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, near the present-day city of Israel called Nablus. The rabbis of the day would not so much as walk on Samaritan soil, let alone speak with a Samaritan or partake of their food and drink. And yet here was Jesus, the rabbi, not only talking to a Samaritan, but a woman, no less. Most rabbis would not condescend to teach religion one-on-one -on -one to a woman. But here was Jesus teaching her and bearing witness to her and speaking to her kindly that he was the Messiah. Even the woman was astounded that Jesus would speak to her and ask her for a drink of water. And as you know the record, this was not just any woman as evidenced by what came out of their conversation. To this woman, accustomed to the daily drudgery of walking to the well, drawing her water and returning, Jesus offered living water. Water that had life in itself. Whosoever drinketh of this water which I shall give him shall never thirst, Jesus promised. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Sir, she said, give me of this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus then told her to go and call her husband. To which the woman responded, and I can imagine with maybe a measure of shame, that she had no husband. And then Jesus said, Thou hast well said, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. End of quote. Evidently, this woman had been married five times and either widowed or divorced each time and at present was living in sin with another man. She was a Samaritan. Strike two. A woman and he a rabbi and an adulteress, shamed and unworthy, 
even among our own people. And yet none of that, none of that mattered to him. Her soul was precious enough that he took the time for her, taught her, and converted her. Tradition holds to this day that that woman's name was Fotina and that she never left the Savior after that and eventually died a martyr for Christ in Rome. This story is one of the most human in the New Testament because it teaches that Jesus cares for his sheep individually, especially the lost and despised ones, even me, even you. I hope you feel the power of that story and of the Lord's love for you. One of the reasons, my friends, I enjoy taking people on tours around the world is that I get to take them to places where significant events in history happened. I love, and you can ask anybody who's ever gone with me, I love to stand there and tell a powerful story and say, that happened right here. It makes this ground holy and sacred to you and me. The following is one of those experiences. The plucky little ATV growled along the trail, chewing through the crusted snow. We had left the shelter of the ranch house and went deeper into the Wyoming sage. It was cold, somewhere below freezing. We traveled over the trail for a couple of miles, then we parked the vehicle and walked the remaining yards to the top of the hill and stood looking out over the beautiful cove sheltered on three sides. As we did so, a feeling of reverence and peace swept over all three of us. Where were we? Standing in the quiet of Martin's Cove. We couldn't help while we stood there think about the pioneers of the Martin Handcart Company who took shelter on this very ground in November 1856. A gentle snow fell in the muted light that afternoon as we walked around this hallowed place, absorbing the tranquility and savoring the feeling. I was shown the old fallen log on which President Gordon B. Hinckley sat and wept as he looked out over Martin's Cove and pondered its history. Here in 1856, Isaac Wardle sat down to die, too tired, too weak, too spent to go any further. Perceiving his dangerous plight, men in the company urged him to get up. They were mean to him. Get up. Go chop some wood. He protested, but they continued until they got him up and chopped the wood. That effort probably saved Isaac Wardle's life. I saw the stumps there in the cove dating back to the winter of 1856 one of which may have actually been the tree that saved Isaac Wardle's life when he chopped it down. In 1856, in that same cove, George Padley and Sarah Ann Franks were there as part of the Martin Company. They had joined the church in England and set out for Zion. They were engaged, betrothed, and according to the accounts, postponed their marriage in order to be sealed by proper priesthood authority in Utah. They were the sweethearts of the Martin Company. By the time they reached this place, though, the journey and the weather had so sapped their strength that both were failing. Sarah was taken into one of the sick wagons to ride. George had overexerted himself in trying to help other members of the handcart company. He had gotten wet and chilled from the winter wind. Suffering from hypothermia and pneumonia, George Padley passed away there in the cove. Knowing what the wolves would do to her beloved's body, 
Sarah asked that he be wrapped in the shawl that her mother had given her when she left England and that his body be placed high up in a tree. As she departed the cove to finish the journey west, she would have looked over her shoulder and seen George's body suspended in the gnarled trees. Her hopes and dreams of a life with George seemingly ended. Subdued. President Bushman, Dennis, me, we walked out of that sacred grove, made all the more sacred by the sacrifices of those who were there. As we did, I turned and looked back over my shoulder and up into those trees. There are not words to describe the hallowed feeling I felt. Martin's Cove is a place made holy, made sacred by its history. And there are so many more places just like it. My beloved friends, it's been a privilege to be with you tonight. I will see you again on Wednesday. God bless and good night.